Let's go. We have Sam. Good morning, everyone. Hi, how are you? I'm here with Lula. Rob's your magnificent, amazing teacher. How are you, Lula? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? It's been a while since our since our first lesson, but I think that's good. It's it's enough time for you to have like had time to practice what we learned. So that's really important. I practice a little bit, um, but um, I I take I kind of took a little bit of a break because. I got mad at chess <laughs> from always like reaching higher elo ranks and winning and then starting to lose so maybe this lesson will appease other people's ego as well um i believe it is normal to go up and down and winning losing streaks uh, i also think taking a break has done me good because now i'm less angry so hopefully <laughs> i i think it's very very normal i'm currently on like a down with my with my blitz rating at the moment but that's okay because you know these these are just arbitrary numbers which see like how well you did recently based on other people like it's not it doesn't actually mean anything it's just kind of how you're doing at the moment but that's going to go up and down no matter what um and yeah, I think breaks from chess are very healthy. I've definitely had breaks from chess myself. Everyone I know who plays chess has had breaks from chess. And chess is something that is like universally frustrating. So if you didn't get frustrated with chess, I would think it's probably because you didn't really care. And it really is a good thing that it shows the, that you kind of care about how you're doing because that will, you know, encourage you to to improve, you know, and grow. And I think that chess is really hard and we don't really give it credit for how hard it is and how we actually all are kind of bad at chess. <laughs> I, I agree with that. It's so difficult because of all the possibilities. And like we were talking if you about before, if you, you learn an opening and you're trying to get all these moves. And so I have this game. Do you, do you see it? Yep. Do you see? Okay. So this is the, I, I know we're, we're down a piece here as white. We're just going to ignore that. Um, because I want to talk about a concept called danger levels, which mm -hmm. is something you know about. Because I see you use it all the time in your games. Um, and so danger levels is when one of your pieces is attacked. And so you attack a piece of equal or higher value before you move your piece. So you okay. play an intermediate move like a check or an attack before you play mm -hmm. a defensive move yep. um and this is something that is a really really important idea in chess because sometimes the best defense is to counterattack, and sometimes the only way to defend is to counterattack. but i think that it's something i've seen that you do a lot and i think it comes from puzzles because usually in puzzles the answer is never going back. It's never playing a defensive move. It's never just moving never. out of the way. In puzzles, it's always sacrifice, check, you know, go for the kill. And this is how I learned to do chess as well, was doing through a lot of puzzles. But one thing my coach actually told me last week when I was playing my chess tournament is the majority of positions are not puzzles. And you should definitely always be on the lookout for checks, captures, attacks on every move. But most positions aren't puzzles, unfortunately. And so most of the time <laughs> we don't get to play these, you know, super exciting, fun moves. And so I wanted to I wanted to draw this to your attention because I noticed that you you do danger levels a lot. We also call this um, an intermezzo or a vision sug. Like that's from German, intermezzo is from Italian or an intermediate move is in English, but we use all of these interchangeably. Um, and so here in this position, you attacked uh, the enemy knight. So your bishop is attacked and you attack the enemy knight. This is danger levels, right? Because you're mm -hmm. attacking a piece of equal value. Um, the only annoying thing though here is that your opponent has this move knight d2. And they do, uh, they do this thing where they get their piece out of danger whilst making an even greater attack at the same time, which is really annoying mm. because now you have two pieces which are under attack, a rook and a bishop. And people do this all the time um, at ratings much, much higher than yours and mine. So don't worry, this is not um, 
uncommon or you shouldn't feel bad about this, but sometimes danger levels doesn't work. And sometimes you do have to go back. So um, what does the computer want here? It probably just wants you to move the bishop. Yeah, it just wants you to move the bishop out of the way. Doesn't really matter where as long as he goes to a safe square. So this is just one example. I saw quite a few times in your games that this is how your opponents won material. So they will attack a piece, you will counterattack, and they'll manage to, to weasel their way out of it somehow, which is very annoying. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that um, it's really important to note that retreating in a position like going back is not like shameful there is nothing wrong with playing a defensive move and i think one thing that we do as chess players all the way up to like below master level is um we are always trying to play really really active aggressive moves when sometimes uh, it's better to play a safe move or a waiting move or to wait for your opponent to self-destruct or something like this, you <laughs> know, so like, funny. but <laughs> it's, it's so real though. It's I so knew. true. Wait for the blunder. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Sometimes yeah. you have a great position and you just need to play consolidating moves or just do a little bit of like quiet shuffling until your opponent kind of runs out of options. Um, and, and so we don't always have to be attacking, attacking, and I don't want to discourage you from attacking because active chess, very important. When I was a beginner, I was not playing enough active chess. I was not attacking enough. And so it's definitely possible to go in the other way. And I would much rather you be like this than like me and be too, uh, too cautious because I think that the best way to learn is to the only way to learn to attack is to attack, you know? You've it's got probably to, do to it. find that balance. Like, wait, is this counterattack productive or not? Like, to maybe suss it out before I actually counterattack. Say, oh, if I counterattack here, he then gets this move. And this exactly. is not a good counterattack. So it's to do it when it's proper to do so, especially if you get to attack a higher value piece. Uh, chances are opponent might want to move the higher end piece because mm -hmm. they don't want a cool trade. They might go for it. But if it's a higher value piece threatened by a lower end piece, it probably um, it's probably better. It's also what you said. Um, I'm going to be very honest here. For those who didn't know, I have a big ego, okay? Like I can't pass on my door. So retreating or a defensive move, did you feel stupidly but they do feel kind of um shameful i'm like oh no i'm not withdrawing i'm gonna keep on pushing forward uh, you know so i have this really strong-headed mentality which is sometimes i could go straight through brick walls um but then you know sometimes i bump my head right in the brick wall and then i get knocked back real bad because when i when i go in I, I go in with everything i've got you know what i'm saying so retreating in chess kind of feels like i'm a loser and i, I, I don't like mean. I don't like it. I don't like backing up. I don't like telling the opponent, okay, yeah, you got me. I'm going to back up now. I don't like doing that. It's like a, mm. am I expressing how I feel properly? Yeah. <laughs> I, I completely understand exactly what you're saying. Um, and especially when you're playing, you know, with the white pieces, you feel like I'm the one who should be attacking here. You know, I, I set the opening, I set the tone of the game, but you know, just because you've got to go back, sometimes <laughs> sometimes the best move is to go back. Um, and I think it was, I, I think it was Grandmaster Vasily Ivanchuk. He's the legendary Grandmaster. He said that the hardest move to find is a backwards knight move in particular, because sometimes we forget that knights can go backwards. But I would apply that to backwards moves in general. Um, sometimes it is just best to go back. Uh, and at all levels, we kind of find that counterintuitive. Um, so, so don't worry, but yeah, sometimes, sometimes it is just best to take a step back, one step back so you can take two steps forward, you know, same in life yeah, exactly. sometimes, sometimes you just need to like chill out a bit so that you have, you know, more energy or resources for later. Listen um, to the lady, listen to the <laughs> lady. She has really good advice if you haven't noticed already. <gasps> So in this position where we went for this danger levels, I also want to make one other point, which is more specific to this position. 
And in this position, unfortunately, our opponent has managed to win some material and, and they are up one piece. Um, they have an extra knight. We don't have a knight. And so one of the questions you had for me was kind of how can we keep going when things aren't going our way or like when we need to, to regroup or find counterplay or when the position seems really complicated, right? That was kind of yep. one of the... And so my biggest tip for you is going to be if your opponent has more material, he's got an extra piece or like an extra two pieces if things are really not going great, um, then um, we want to keep as many of our pieces on the board as possible. We don't want to trade. And so in this position, um, danger levels is a trade, right? Because if he takes your bishop, you take his knight and that's a trade. Um, if danger levels did work, that's what would happen. We would have a trade. And you're already down this, this piece. And so we don't want to trade. Because then we have one less uh, piece in our army to, f to fight with and to attack the enemy king. And the fewer pieces, the less counterplay you're likely to have because you don't have as much activity. And activity in chess is really key because that's how we're going to checkmate the king or set up tactics or, you know, um, win the sense. end game. So, um, so, yes, in this position, definitely better to preserve your bishop even if the danger levels did work, even if it worked, we want to preserve think, the bishop. Yeah, also, I think I would have probably went to like f4 to actually protect yeah. the d2 square to avoid the knight going That's there perfect. and attacking the, the rook, you know. Now that uh, I see yeah, it, it makes sense. It. <laughs> the thing is also is, is you're doing great here because you've activated your queen um, and this bishop is really strong and you're you're kind of attacking a very weak king right he's pushed this c pawn in front of his king he's castled long and so if you can get enough counterplay and enough activity your king is actually safer than his so um so we definitely want to keep on our biggest attacking pieces and like for example this bishop even though a bishop is worth three and a rook is worth five this bishop is much more active than this rook on a1 right so it's a much more valuable piece currently because he's doing a much bigger job so we definitely want to keep our best attacking pieces and this is something i want you to have in the back of your mind when you're when you're playing chess is that just because this piece is worth three doesn't mean it's doing the job the same job as another piece worth three or even another piece worth five and something that we see like very strong chess players do a lot is they will s often sacrifice a rook for a really really strong bishop i get it um, yeah because like right now the bishop yeah. is like stuck to go in the corner um mm -hmm. you know the only safe spot for the bishop right now would be like b um b8 uh for, not for, the, for the king so keeping that queen in the combo with the bishop is always is obviously more um valuable exactly. than my rook who's not even activated on you know a1 exactly and and so this is something that I want you to keep in mind is that not all minor pieces are made equal and you can have a superior minor piece and an inferior minor piece and minor pieces are our pieces that are worth three so our knights and our bishops um, and this is quite an advanced concept the superior minor piece is something that is talked about in a really famous chess book called how to reassess your chess by Jeremy Silman it's a really, really popular chess book, but it's aimed at 1400 and up. So I'm not going to recommend it. But this concept <laughs> of the superior minor piece is something that you can definitely start to think about is, is my bishop going to be better than that knight? Or in the end game, is this bishop going to be my useful piece because he's long range compared to that knight who's going to have a harder time stopping a pawn, for example, because he's slower. So this is something that we can kind of have in mind for the the long term because I think I remember when I was quite new to chess I was very happy to make trades of equal material pretty much all the time because it's better to trade a piece than to lose the piece later that was my outlook I was like oh, well if I trade this night I can't 
hang the night. Um, and that's what True. I thought. <laughs> it's um, it's a little bit how I think as well. I'm like, well, hey, if I get the bishops off the board, at least there's no bishops for anyone. And they, they won't come and bite me in the ass later. Uh, for sure. So, yeah, and, it's... and this is, you know, sometimes this is the way to go, especially, you know, if your opponent's bishops are much more active than yours. That's why I want you to keep in mind which of your pieces are the strongest or or are doing the best job. So we can look a little bit more at, about this game. So your opponent played the Sicilian and we had a little chat about the Sicilian before this. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, I said the Sicilian is very scary, but it's played at all levels anyway, even if we should or shouldn't be playing it because it's so complicated. Um, <laughs> it's so, so complicated and messy. Um, but I see that you're, you're still going for like your, your regular setup, which is fine. Honestly, it's fine. This is perfect because he's played a very strange move here, right? Um, I was like, uh, I didn't like that. I didn't like that. Yeah, and it's it's not it's not one of the main moves in this position. The main moves are gonna be like knight c six or like d six or like e yeah. six. So yeah, this is um, what is this is the. One, two, three, four, five, sixth most popular move. So it's not, you know, not in the top five. You're not going to be seeing it all the time. Yeah. Um, and so absolutely, you know, protecting your pawn. And he is now playing. This is much more of a Sicilian type move. Although I don't think he really knows what's going on. So don't worry. Um, and so I like that you give this check here. I think that you can um I think that you can probably just play d4 if you if you want to if you want to because um this pawn if he takes then we have these really nice knights right and True. the the problem we got into here was that our opponent kind of got this nice center right um and well, okay, they kind of messed up their own center. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. They but, yeah. still won, then, though. They still won. They did win. And it's tricky, right? Because actually this knight probably has to come back here. And that's very, you know, very unpleasant. But it's hard to see that these are, like, long-term long -term weaknesses. Like, the, the pawn structure is not great. But but it's, it sucks when they play strange things and still win. Um... And obviously, this is where we we did danger levels, and we don't have to talk so much more about it. Um, and and here you took the pawn. I think I probably would have preserved the bishop. I don't know. Oh what yeah. The computer wants. The I computer... don't know why I did that. Like yeah, plus we're below in material. That was a blunder. Like why would I take a pawn? I have no idea what went through my mind doing that. I was probably just angry because okay. we were like losing. So I just said, hey, I'll take a pawn. It, it was, it was, that was, that was not good. <laughs> so sometimes if you're going to have to give up a piece or material, you can take a pawn, but usually it's taking like a, a pawn with check or, you know, checking the king or something like that. Here we can, we can preserve the bishop. And even if they take, we are, um, uh we're losing the exchange so we're losing the rook for the knight and we're losing the exchange instead of losing a whole piece and and so because we were down a piece and we've lost an exchange we're now down a rook but i think this would still be a better situation than than uh here because things kind of went a bit pear-shaped um and we, we got a very vulnerable king but that's okay we we live and we learn and this was a an instructive game we can move on <laughs> it was it was it just got worse and worse i was just like oh screw it oh screw it it just got worse <laughs> i know what it you was mean. not a I, good game yeah i've i've done i've done similar things when things are not going well um but the the main instructive point i wanted to talk to you about here was danger levels yeah because that's really helpful it is like a very important thing in chess i don't want you to stop doing it forever I just want you to, when you play danger levels, you need to kind of go through a checklist in your mind. You need to think, can they counterattack my counterattack, basically? I'm doing a counterattack, but can they escalate that even further? 
Or one of the other key things is, can they check me to get out of the attack? Because a check is the most forcing move in chess. You can't do anything whilst your king is in check other than get out of check. So this is the main thing we need to check. Sorry, I just used the word check a lot of times. This is the it's main fine. thing we need to ensure <laughs> is that our opponent cannot get out with another danger levels slash counterattack. Yeah, um, makes total sense. Which makes it a very complicated thing because then you're looking several moves in advance at different kinds of tactics. Um, and it goes, it, it goes to become a calculation exercise rather than a let's just move our piece out of the way. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to tell you, most chess positions, unfortunately, are not puzzles. So you'll make that your too life makes a lot sense simpler. because mm -hmm. now I'm I'm getting really good and quick at puzzles. I'm getting ten yeah. in a row, fifteen in a row, and like I mm -hmm. I see it because I know kind of what the puzzle wants. I was like, oh, they want yeah. me to do back back, back row checkmate, whatever. Mm -hmm. But none of the games I've played felt like a puzzle. Right. None, because it's unexpected. Puzzles are already pre-planned position. Exactly. Um, but when you play with someone, you never know what they're going to do. You, you just, no. that's, that's, you know, it's exhilarating, but it's also quite frustrating at the same time. So for mm -hmm. now, I'm going to slack a little bit on puzzles because I feel like I do <laughs> very well at puzzles, but it doesn't always apply to the games that I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. um, so I told, it totally makes sense. I just need to ask myself more. Is this counterattack valuable? Like what other things can the opponent do before I choose to counterattack, which is I don't do. I just go for the attack. I'm like, aha, <laughs> I, I just, I should just take a bit more time. I, yeah, because I love to see that you're playing these longer games. This, I think it was a 15 minute game. Um, mm -hmm. And you do have the time in these 15 minute games to, to go through this little checklist. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want you to quit doing puzzles, but I, I think just doing a couple, um, like for example, one round of puzzle rush, like three minute or five minute puzzle rush before you start playing is probably enough, you know? Um, and sitting and doing like hours and hours of puzzles, you don't have to, you know, it can be, it can be really good training for pattern recognition, but the most valuable thing is always going to be playing chess. Um, and True. yeah, exactly. So True. puzzles are great. Warm up. They really are. Yes, I agree. <laughs> People like the, I'll agree with Lula. <laughs> that, please don't quit puzzles. That's not what I wanted. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> just, just take a bit of a setback, let's say on puzzles, because they, yeah. they are great warm ups and they do teach you really good tactics. It's just, mm -hmm. I have to keep in mind that not everything I see in puzzles are applicable when you play uh, with someone. Um, it's like when you right. play with bots, bots will always do those specific moves because they're coded that way to, to show mm -hmm. you different moves. So when you play against someone, it's completely different. Exactly. Humans are very unpredictable in comparison. Um, I wanted to, before we look at end games, I wanted to look at this, your most recent chess game, because I know that you've been having a frustrating time with chess and that's probably the most relatable thing you could say because every chess player has big frustrations with chess and we all feel annoyed or even angry at the game and ourselves at times in our chess journeys so okay I, makes me feel a bit better <laughs> i thought that um if we went through your most recent game um because i know you haven't been playing a lot lately because of this frustration that at least we could turn this into more of a productive positive thing and we could kind of see what's what's getting you down about chess or like where you feel um you need a bit more support maybe uh so i love to see that you're still playing e4 and even though we didn't go for our scotch that's absolutely fine there is nothing wrong with going for like a three nights four nights kind of setup and your opponent didn't play into four nights but that's okay we have this very nice development i love to see that you're getting your king ready for castling so far i have absolutely no criticisms for you you're playing perfectly uh principled chess which is is great because it shows that you you understand more than tactics you understand the opening principles and that's really important and then your opponent hits you with this horrible f5 move and i think that this is where things start to get frustrating i'm like what the heck i'm like if i take then he develops his bishop and take back and i was like mm -hmm. i oh i hate that right I was like, <laughs> 
so this in, not in this particular line because I, I play I play bishop b5 and I play the Spanish but there is something very similar in what I play where they hit with a, um, an early f5 and it's called the Schliemann or the Yenish gambit um, and you never take it you never take it uh, because if you do they are always gonna start like pushing as well as you know basically the whole point in in i mean it's not a gambit but the whole point in these kinds of flank pawn pushes is to kind of get rid of your central control and now that you don't have a pawn on e4 um you don't have anything to stop them from pushing right and that's really annoying because there's a reason we put up one on e4. It was to, to fight for space in the center. And so I think here, what I would do, um, I think the safest thing to do is to play d3. The computer says all sorts of things, um, like d4, the computer says yeah. you can take. But I think the most solid option is to always defend the pawn. Because if you then at some point decide to capture, let's say they play another developing move, then you can always capture later. And the difference in capturing later after you've played d3, not that I suggest capturing because I would wait for them to capture, but you then have a pawn on d3. So they're not going to be pushing. And you'd kind of still have a little bit more, a little bit more control. Um, my general advice is to just never capture this pawn and to let them capture. And when they capture, we're, we're very happy because we still have our e4 pawn. And now we have a little bit of imbalance in the position, which means that there's some asymmetry. That's because we have no pawn on the d file and he has no pawn on the f file. So these files are now semi-open because they don't have two pawns on them. They only have one pawn from somebody. Exactly. Um, so I would be very happy to have this position as white because this is basically what you have usually just without the d pawn. So you can still go about your normal stuff. And, and that's why when somebody throws these weird things at me, I'm never going to capture because it's going to take me out of my comfort zone into a position they want into something they've prepared. And there is no reason that you need to entertain them. So I saw that you castled <laughs> like this. Yeah. The only frustration now is that if your opponent plays um, like very, the very best moves, we have captures uh, and captures. This is what you played. And then he has this move, which he didn't play right <sighs> here. He played later. But obviously this is a very annoying pawn fork, right? Yes. And um, that's a tactic and it's very, very frustrating. It happens. Uh, it happens to all of us. Don't worry. Uh, but this is why sometimes we just need to, we need to think, why has he pushed that? Has he pushed it because he wants to capture? And if he does capture, we almost always want to be capturing this with a pawn. Uh, when you capture in the opening with a piece, there's usually going to be another pawn push. There are other positions like this um, in, for example, the Queen's Gambit, which is um, when something like this happens and they defend with a knight and you have captures, captures, and then basically because you recapture with a piece instead of a pawn, white gets to push another pawn. And this is kind of what happened in your game. Um, this is why in, we're almost always wanting to be supporting our central pawns with other pawns because pawns are great for taking space in the middle and they're very sturdy. And they all like, protect each other. There. They all protect exactly. each other too. It creates a really strong line of defense. Exactly. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So if this happens again or if they're throwing some, some weird stuff at you, Don't go you for can it. always just say, oh, if you capture... I'm just going to capture back. Like now what do you, you just have a weak king. Like this, this is a very weak king. And because your bishop is so nice, your bishop is great here. He's not castling this way because you can't castle into or through check. So he's going to have to go this way. And so there's, you know, he's not playing the most principled way. 
Um, and unfortunately for him, it just worked out because he surprised you with his with his opening. And it happened to me in my tournament last week. I got surprised in the opening because there are so many openings. How are you expected to know them all? You're not. Nobody of course not. You can't. Them. No, um, you can't. And so here he didn't play this d5 move. He played bishop f5. Maybe he just didn't notice that this was possible right now. And you play d3, which usually would be awesome if there wasn't this d5 annoying thing which unfortunately he does figure out soon. Um, and, and he does hit us with this. But, but yeah, um, I mean, here, if d5, we kind of have a danger levels, right? Um, because we have this danger levels, if takes, we're going to take. And you're, you're the pro at danger levels, so I would think you would find this. Um, no, uh, now yes, he... but I don't know what went, again. I don't know what went through my mind. <laughs> I look at this and I'm like, oh god, it's so like not embarrassing, but it's like, why? What went but through my brain? It's not at all embarrassing because the difficult thing, right, is you've developed your pieces, you've castled, you've tried to control the center, you've played principal chess. You technically haven't done anything wrong. It's just there is this tactic, and the tactic is as a result of the fact that you've no longer got a central pawn and you've recaptured here with the knight. And um, it's just really unfortunate because it's a weird situation. You wouldn't usually have this situation. True. Bishop G, Bishop G5, I usually would love because look, now he's not castling either side. Still though with the D5, there is some other spicy stuff going on here as a result <laughs> of your opponent's super weak king. So mm -hmm. you can always look for this kind of fried liver style tactics and attacks. Um, this isn't, you know, the fried liver, but um, this kind of knight and bishop combo. F7 is always the weakest square in black's position because it is, when we start the game, it is the only square that is just defended by the king. And the king is not a great defender because as soon as there are two pieces, we're looking at like, checkmate um exactly. or you know so this is a really weak king and even if he castles um then you have this fork on the oh. rooks you're going to be winning material so even if he gets this king out of there you know he's got problems and it's not super easy to to defend this what do we do i'm thinking the problem with, I don't know why the computer is wanting knight, oh, is wanting h6 because we are still coming in here. I would have thought that knight h6 would make more sense because knight h6 defends f7, but, but okay, Sockfish has some inhuman stuff they want to talk about in this position because this king is very weak. The That would be the theme. Basically, there's a grandmaster called Ben Feingold. And one of his most famous quotes is never play F6. Um, your opponent here <laughs> didn't play F6, he played F5. But with the same idea, he really, really weakened his uncastled king. And king safety is the absolute 100% most important thing in chess because if your king dies, game over. Um, and this king is very, very weak because if we ever manage to open this up, then he's gonna, it's going to be lights out. Uh, oh yeah yes. wow so what i want to say is if something weird happens in the opening like here we always want to ask ourselves did our opponent make a mistake or did they make a blunder and if so does that mean i can exploit it somehow and if your opponent makes an opening mistake or opening blunder to give you an advantage then sometimes you break the rules in order to capitalize on that. So yeah. I will have told you in the past, try not to move the same piece twice in the opening. I will have told you this. And this is one of the opening principles is that you get all your pieces out before you start running them around the board. Before we move this bishop five times, we're going to get the other pieces out. Um, but when your opponent plays unprincipled moves, like opening up their king a lot, we can start to move 
pieces if it comes with very, very serious direct threats, like this threat on the king. Oh, so this yeah. knight has moved three times now, right? He's come to here, he's come to here, and now he's come to here. And so he's moved three times and it's move eight. I would still call that the opening. Uh, even if we have moved this knight three times in the opening, it's because we have really, really good reason to. And we're still playing principal chess because, you know, we've still castled. We've actually got a lot of development already. And our mm -hmm. opponent is opening themselves up to attacks. So A lot of people are saying they love how Lula is teaching and they love your approach because they think it makes sense. You. I just want to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's very sweet. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I guess the, the main less, the main uh, theme in this lesson is going to be that chess rules are made to be broken because <laughs> because we have a uh, we have a lot of rules and um, and one of the things about improving at chess is learning all of these nuances and um, rules of thumb are very handy but it's never going to be a one size fits all so we have to jump at chances like this if we get them. And it's also which order you're going to, mm -hmm. because there's so many rules. So when, when you decide yeah. to break a rule, what's the order of the other rules before you break mm -hmm. this specific rule? So this is where um, yeah. analysis and, um, you know, the interaction that you have with the board and your all the calculation, like, well, if I break this rule and get this done, then I could break this rule and get this done. So it, it mm -hmm. becomes endless possibilities. And For sometimes sure. I feel like I, I get brain dead, like I'm exhausted <laughs> after I play chess. I get chess really exhausted. It's like, wow, my brain is tired. Like, I, oh, you know, That's absolutely I don't know if it's normal. normal. It's so tiring. I, I think there was a study or something that showed that during classical chess games, top players burn so many calories, like just because their brain is working so, so hard. They're oh sad my still. God. But I mean, their heart rate is going to shoot up because they're feeling a lot of like adrenaline and yeah, they burn a lot of calories playing chess, which is kind of a crazy thought. Hey, but it, it is well, exhausting. The, the whole thing with rules is tricky. I would say the most important rule in, in chess is always to prioritize your king's safety. This is always going to be the number one above everything and nothing else is ever going to take precedence over the safety of your king because you can come back from anything else but checkmate, you know, that's it, that's game over. Of so, course. So king safety is always number one. And, you know, you're still following a lot of the chess rules. And so I'm, I'm not mad, I'm not going to be mad at you because you missed this idea because you're thinking, oh, well, it's, it's only move seven. Queen d7 is played. I shouldn't be, you know, moving all my pieces again already. And I, so you develop your final minor piece. You play such a principled move. You follow everything you've been taught. And and you get punished for it because they play d5. And that is so frustrating. I know that's so frustrating for you because it, it, it's one of those times when it's like chess is bullshit. Chess is not fair, you know? <laughs> like this, this shouldn't happen. I'm developing my pieces. But yeah, this, this whole center situation as a result of f5 is really, really unfortunate. And we no longer have, um, any nice danger levels to get out of it, unfortunately. Um, so you try to go for a tactic, which I completely get, you know, we're losing a piece anyway, got to do it. Unfortunately, this doesn't work because we end up losing two the pieces. The pawn, oh my God, I know. That was so like, why of all things that I choose to do that? I, like, I, I was like, oh, I'm going to attack your queen. Like if I forgot about the pawn and the knight that could take, you know, my knight. So I was it, like, it's okay. You, mm. so you've been put in a position where you've been forked and you're like, I'm going to lose a piece anyway. What do I do? And unfortunately this doesn't work. I love the creativity. This is also why I wanted to talk to you about most positions, not being puzzles, because all of these moves that you make show me that you've been doing puzzles, which is a really good thing. It shows me that you're always looking for tactics and you're always looking for creative ways out. And creativity in chess is absolutely not to be, um, it's so important. If you're not playing creative chess, then you're never going to find your way out of difficult positions. Um, and I promise you this will eventually pay off. There will eventually be a position where this you're was getting hope chess. in the middle. This, 
This was literally, you know, the one thing we don't want to do. This was hope chess. I hope he okay. moves the queen. I hope he falls for it. And then when okay. you start hoping, <laughs> you shouldn't play hope chess. Someone is asking, would c5 be a good move? In in this position to go knight c5, I think they're probably just going to take here. Um, and then we are going to have to to move the bishop anyway. So... I mean, in this position, it's very hard to say what is the best move. I mean, it would be either taking this pawn, because then at least we get a pawn for a piece, right? Um, and then he's up two points of material, but if we want another two pawns back, maybe we would be equal. Um, or something that Mr. Computer wants, which I don't find superhuman, uh is that he wants this move but i probably would just take the pawn because yeah you have to you have to you know this is like a a more of a tactical solution is you get a bit of counterplay because you have this pin on the knight but you're not actually winning material back um sorry that is not the move what does he go queen queen d5 um yeah, you're not actually winning material back. You're just getting a slightly better version of the being down a piece situation. Mm -hmm. um, so I think here you just have to accept your fate that you're losing a piece. And, and at I least would, take a piece. Just I, take. Yeah, I would expect most players, including myself, probably here yeah, to, to just take the pawn. Um, because also his two pawns here, let's try and look on the bright side. His two pawns here are really strong, right? He's got the center, but if we're at least capturing one of them and his king is still weak and we have the chance to, you know, we're only, we're down, we're down two points of material. Okay. But we have chances to like, we still have counterplay. This is why it's important to keep as many pieces on as possible, because if we have all of these pieces, then we have more chances of counterplay. Most games will be decided by who has the most pieces and then gets the checkmate or who has the most pieces and then promotes a pawn. Like at some point, material is going to be won through a tactic or a blunder. Um, but I don't know about you. I've played many games where I've hung a piece, then my opponent's hung a piece or vice versa. And the eval bar is going to go up and down and up and down, and it's gonna it's gonna be a roller coaster. And it's not just because you've you've lost a piece in the opening that the game is over. You have to fight. Chess is, you know, it's a fighting game. So the way yeah, I look I, at the I, board I now, um, probably I, I'm thinking, would c4 mm -hmm. be good right now? Make an attack on the queen. All pieces are like protected. So if queen captures anything, they're all protected so we're forcing the queen to like retaliate and we're getting a little bit more center would c4 be a good move in this position i think c4 would be possible for sure the only thing we need to be aware of when we make pawn moves is that they're never ever going back so let's say the queen is retreating um what i want to talk about is what what we've left behind by moving this pawn to c4 and mm -hmm. so now we have this pawn who is on the semi-open file because it's just him. We don't have Black's deep pawn. And now this pawn is what you call a backwards pawn, which means he can't really be pushed forward um, and there's no more pawns behind him. And so he's kind of a longer term weakness. Um, and if, let's say, for example, much later in the game, lots of rooks and queens got piled up on him there's a good chance he would fall off the board he would be captured because he can't be defended by other pawns so now it's a it's a bit of a weakness um we took space with this pawn and we kicked the queen back but we do have like a more of a long-term weakness here now being down a piece is obviously more of an urgent issue than a long-term weakness of a backwards pawn. But I want you to know about this because I could just say, yeah, let's kick the queen away. But in in the long run, you may find that you have difficulties um, with having to use your pieces, your remaining pieces to babysit pawns. Yeah, because now we were leaving yeah. that pawn uh, very weak. But then I was thinking maybe we could pin uh, the knight with a queen. Uh, like we, we could start like moving right. pieces and yeah, try to like not attack, but, you know, like, 
get our pieces out there. Um, For sure. I absolutely love this idea that um, we're we're activating all of our pieces and that we're doing that through this. We, we attack with tempo and then we create space for our queen. Yeah, at the same time, I thought that's why I thought it was a good move because I was like, we're freeing the way for a queen to pin the knight yeah. and we're also kicking back the queen. So that moves for me serves mm -hmm. to um, uh, serves two purposes. So I was wondering if my brain was computing right or not. Yeah, no, I, I think this is a great idea. I just think first I would want to do something about this knight <laughs> in the middle. No, no, no. Yeah. I genuinely think it's it's very cool and very advanced, actually, that you're thinking I'm going to do this with tempo to then get this queen out to, to pin the knight. This is really good stuff. But the thing is, what we mentioned earlier, when I said, um, when we're down material, we don't want to trade more material, right? Exact. Right. Um, and so if we go for this, um, the only thing is they can trade more material, which we don't really want um, because we have less. So we want to keep on as much as possible. So I think before I went for any of these other um, moves for my queen, I would probably try and move my knight out of the way, either to g3 to get this tempo on the bishop, which is kind of nice. Or you can also move it to c3 to get this tempo on the queen, going with your idea of attacking the queen. And one of the things I like about moving this knight is because this file can be opened up, maybe. And this king oh. cannot get castled. So you see how our knight is kind of blockading this and acting as like a, a wine cork in the position. Um, if we can kind of get our knight out let's say, okay, the queen is going to have to move. Um, and then we bring our rook here. Then oh, all yeah. of a sudden we're getting this counterplay that we're looking for uh, because we, we have moved the knight out of this, this central line on the e-file. And this pawn is isolated, which means he has no friends to back him up and defend him. And now, instead of you having the, the backwards pawn that needs to be defended by pieces, your opponent has this isolated pawn that needs to be defended by pieces. And he has a very, very weak king because of your great bishop here. And now, all of a sudden, even though your opponent is up material, you have initiative and you have activity, which is really, really important in chess. And you I'm can... seeing so many possibilities right now. I'm like, oh my god, look at that. We could take the pawn with the knight, then we're threatening the queen. He's going to probably take back with the knight, but then we can move the rook and check the king. And then there's all these, blah, 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 you know? It's exactly. So... <laughs> exactly, exactly. Which is why for, for black here, He's not actually got that many options. He's gonna have to play something like the bishop here to stop you from to stop you from taking the pawn, or like something like this. And you know things, even though black is objectively better because he's got an extra piece here. Um, you know, if Stockfish is really recommending he plays king f7 because his king's really not safe there, then it means you have really good chances to to get an attack going and to get some counterplay um so yeah this is um this is what i wanted to mention about about attacking because i know you love to attack and i want to see you attack um, <laughs> but we've got to keep as many pieces on the board as possible in order mm -hmm. to attack and if we let him trade pieces off then we're playing into his hands and we don't want to do that you're really nailing um, it to a T because um, even when I'm down in material, I'm very persistent to keeping attacking because like I said before, I have a big ego and I don't like to draw back. Mm -hmm. So even I'm like, oh, I'm going to trade, I'm going to trade, I'm going to trade. But then at the end, when you're down with only pawns, but the yeah. opponent has pawns and a bishop, this is where you really see the difference because opponent will always have that extra piece. So mm -hmm. I think I'm going to just start like, okay, we're down in material now. Um, either we counterattack and ensure that the counterattack is profitable or we just take a step back or move something else, play something defensive you don't necessarily have to withdraw the piece can i protect that piece that i did mm -hmm. the counter attack with to ensure that if it's taken you know it's double protected like can i just protect um to, so there, there's just i just have to be careful with that you always <laughs> no i'm not always aggressive that's not true take that back <laughs> <laughs> take that back uh -huh. so yeah i think i think you're 100 right i just have to gauge um if it's pertinent to keep on attacking for sure 
And I think that even though this knight move I'm suggesting does technically go backwards, it's still a very active move. We're getting a tempo on either piece and we're opening up for the attack on the king. So mm -hmm. yeah, this is, this is very, very key. And I really love that you are so active with your bishops. Same as in the other game, you've had really active bishops and we have to always remember that the king can never castle through a check. And so if we can stop our opponent from castling, that's great because his king is not going to be as safe as ours. We've already got castled. Our king is already safe. And, you know, what is, you know, one of our bishops being taken if we can, you know, checkmate their king? That's much more important. Exactly. So. I'm taking so many notes. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> so this is great. Let's go back to, let's go back to the game. What we yep. had. So we had this knight f6 check and captures, 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 captures. Okay. So that was it's terrible. okay. It's okay. So we have um, a little bit of a discrepancy here in, in material. Um, and I think that, I think that here, we needed to maybe like take stock and say, oh, like we just lost two pieces, right? And I think we probably just had to go back. Um, yeah. But, you know, I've, I very much respect the attack, you know? I, I know that you want to always be moving forward, but at some point we're going to run out of ammunition, unfortunately. And we, we, I think we did run out of ammunition, ammunition we did. here. <laughs> um, so cool. We won a piece back. Very nice. Your opponent tried to go for danger levels and it didn't work. So this is great. Your opponent goes for danger levels and you counterattack. Love to see it. Uh, <laughs> push it back. And this queen check. And we played rook f2 which also defends this cool because if they take okay and we went for danger levels again <laughs> no 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 i'm not sorry i'm not trying to be critical. no 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 not at all i was just like well you take back wait i think you're a sucker but it's kind of <laughs> you know it's uh, i don't know why i it's it's a it's like a flaw i guess because i i really I should just learn to control it, but I think that was a good counterattack, though, because I was like, if you take my queen, I take yours. But then there's also the possibility if he takes the queen, he's also threatening my other rook. So I, I didn't compute further down than the queen exchange, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think the the big problem here is that if he takes, he takes with check. Um, and so if he takes with check, we can't take because check, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then he gets to move away or, you know, he gets to take a pawn or whatever he does. The point being, he still has the queen. Now, yeah. I think we were a bit lucky that our, that our <laughs> opponent didn't see that it came with check because if we had lost the queen with check, then we would have lost our biggest attacking piece. We didn't. It's okay. And... So where did we go? Okay, so we took the knight. I think, I think that actually you do have chances in this position, but you need to keep an eye on the queen because the open king, the open king, one thing that I have, I learned only recently is, or not learned, but had to accept is that if we get rid of the queen or, or, or the queens, Mm -hmm. We're probably not going to get a checkmate. And that's something I didn't, I didn't want to accept because if the queens are traded off really early in a game, I still want to go for checkmate. I still want to hunt down the king. But if we don't have a queen, then the king hunt is almost never going to go our way. Um, so opening up the king, love. But uh, I think we just need to, to be a little bit more like... Vigilant. Active. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, cool. I think that doubling up with Brooks is always a good idea. 
But I had only... check. I had check. Why didn't I like? Yeah, I like this check actually. Um, I do like Why it. Didn't... I like it, but the 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 problem in this position, I think, is that you've now got kind of a weak king as well, and we don't have that many pieces left in our army. And the bishop pair is kind of almost like having Bidly. you know an extra queen sometimes if they're really fully activated. Um, so so it's tough. I also think that here your opponent could have, and they didn't, I think they could have sacrificed their queen for your two rooks because now you have no pieces at all and they've still got these three pieces. So True. this is something I wanted to point out that your opponent didn't do, but I want you to know about it for you as well. Because if sometimes you're up so much material that you're going to be winning even if you sack your queen, sometimes it is a lot simpler to sacrifice your queen. Um, because if they have no pieces, they have almost no counterplay. The only counterplay your, your opponent has if they have no pieces is maybe queening a pawn and getting a new piece. The key point being having pieces in order to get counterplay. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. So if you ever are in a position like this where you can sacrifice your queen, especially, I mean, for two rooks, because two rooks and a queen are kind of the same value anyway, then we always want to be simplifying into a position where we have material and our opponent has no counterplay especially like if you have a queen and your opponent has a knight then that knight can always fork your king and queen right true so sometimes if we have like rooks or we have other pieces then we wouldn't even mind sacrificing for a knight or for something like that because we have enough material to still win um, you're right you're um, so right I just love listening to how you're explaining um, rules or strategies and then you actually show on the board, you make like a great, great correlation between all elements and it's just so easy when you're there. <laughs> I know, you what, you, I know so what you mean. Chess always feels simpler when it's somebody else who's explaining it to you. I yeah. feel the same way. Um, but but yeah anyway so i don't want to spend too much more time on this game because oh because it just um, went sour after that i just yeah, yeah because we just we don't have uh we got i mean your opponent got a nice checkmate but that's not what we were looking for so um let's take a little look at some king and pawn end games oh yes yes uh, yes, yes because they can be very frustrating if you haven't looked at them before and sometimes when you get them, you don't have much time left because it's at the end of the game and then it's very stressful. So, so can you see this position? Yep. yep. Okay. So this position is imagining you are white here and you've got this one extra pawn. And now that you know how to checkmate with a queen and a king, because you learned it last time and you've done it you know that you only need to be able to promote this in order to win, even though it's just one pawn left. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> I would feel like I was like, whatever. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you to, I promise this is the last concept I'm going to introduce you to today, but this is kind of a complicated one. Um, it is the, the concept of opposition. And opposition is when we put our king facing the other king it's it's just that but it's always gonna have to be an odd number of squares between them so there's just one square um you can also have distant opposition where let's just um let's just for the sake of it um go here so this is distant opposition because there are three squares three squares um now opposition is something you have which sounds weird. But in order to have opposition, you have to be the player who moved in front of the other king. So, okay. So here, you take opposition because you are the one moving in front to look at the other king. Your king is looking at his king. And this is important because your king is creating this invisible wall between you and the other king. 
and you can't and go and you can't go they, forward they can't kiss because that would technically be check in a really weird way um <laughs> so because they can't get closer i just stare at you do, he has to move sideways and that is very key here because then you get to move upwards and this is how we're going to promote the porn because if we look at this position, it looks kind of like, how are we going to promote this? He's in the way. Um, and yes, so someone in chat is saying opposition is a form of Zugzwang. This is another German word in chess. And it basically directly translates as compulsion to move, which in very, very simple terms means he's forced to make a move and usually a move he doesn't want to make. So it comes down to the point where you have no good moves left. And the good move here would be if your opponent could move a different piece. Because then his king is always staying here and you are never promoting the pawn. Just if give his me one king second. Is... No, no worries. Uh... Sorry about that. No, don't worry. Um, it was it was a, a double, um, a, a, like a funny joke, but it, it could have been perceived um, negative. So I just said, I'm just explaining. Quarantine is really not against you because the video is going to go on YouTube after. So some people might take offense in the joke, even though I'm, I was cracked up. I just had to remove the, the joke because it's going to go on YouTube. Don't be mad at me, okay? I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lila. Um, so, no, don't worry. In... in <laughs> Sorry. In Black's ideal world here, he would keep his king here forever because then you can never promote your pawn because he's occupying the queening square. But because he has no other pieces to move, no other pawns to move, he's he forced is to go sideways. Forced to go sideways. And that's why it's so important for us to be the one that takes opposition. Uh, because otherwise we would the one that has to move sideways and then he gets to to stay so then we can come up and then we can promote the pawn holy shit <laughs> so one of the best ways that i've had it explained to me or one of the most fun ways is like the king this is the like the runway or like the landing strip for the aeroplane and your king has to control these squares so the the pawn can can come through oh my and god it's, it's like the it's, it's like the, the the tower the controlling center so the king is the like the control exactly. tower that helps your pawn land oh i love that exactly <laughs> i cannot stress enough how important it is to have your king controlling these squares in front of the pawn when you're trying to queen a pawn you can never queen a pawn on its own. The king is the escort and the escort is necessary. Otherwise, the other king's just going to come and take your pawn. So your king needs to always be ahead of the pawn. That's the key thing. Because let me, let me show you. If, if we're kind of, um, if we're coming backwards, then all of a sudden this is going to be a drawn position. I have the, the evaluation bar on now saying that this is a draw. And this is a draw because your king is back here and he's not ever getting forwards. Um, he's, not, he's not getting forwards because you don't get opposition. And so this is going to lead into the next one I want to show you, which is how to draw one of these positions if you are the other side. Yeah, of course. Because... <laughs> It's it's very important that you know how to draw these because you don't want to feel, oh, he's got another pawn, I'm lost. You know, you don't want that to be the situation. So if, you know, if unfortunately their king is escorting the pawn, then it's already game over. But this time their king is behind the pawn. And so we are controlling these queening squares, the really important squares. And that means that this is going to be a draw because they're never, ever going to get to promote that pawn 
safely ever it's not gonna happen it's funny like like i told you oh the stale master xenia is coming i i don't know why i love going for stalemate i calculate this the, the moves to stalemate i'm like if i do this and the plus that and i play this and i play that's gonna be stalemate i just i don't like losing <laughs> so i'd rather go for that's... stalemate <laughs> have you heard of eric rosen no he is an international master and he has made such a like name for himself online for all of his stalemate traps and tricks. He has so many <laughs> YouTube videos um, about his stalemate traps and tricks. You should go and watch them. I'll I'll link them to you after. Please. That and he's an international master. That's that is uh, the second highest title after grandmaster. So that's really oh, wow. he's very very strong, and wow. he's still going for these stalemate you know, tricks in online chess. So there is absolutely no shame in going for stalemate. You know, you should always try to get the draw whenever you can. It's half a point instead of zero. It's really important, especially, you know, if it's an important game or you're playing a tournament. So you should always try and hold on until the end. Like you should always fight till the end. It's it's, I think it's what I love the most about chess is it's mm -hmm. not just, it's not just about winning or losing. You have a way to make it even so both players could agree to a draw. Um, exactly. You have a way of purposely placing yourself in a position where you're not letting the other opponent win. Um, and it's also showing that you have to win, you have to deliver the win. You cannot just like, if you're gonna checkmate, you gotta deliver the checkmate, you gotta deliver it properly. So even if in a really winning position, you fall into the trap of stalemate, that means you didn't calculate your possibilities properly. So you have to win and win with dignity, or you could lose and lose with dignity as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's what I find very exhilarating about chess. Oh, I'm losing, I'm gonna go for stalemate. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> I love it. It's yeah. And there are actually some stalemate tricks inbuilt into some chess end games. I think maybe in a few months I can show you some of them. It's a little bit advanced for right now, but there's some really key stalemate ideas in certain pawn queen endings. Um, so it's really cool, actually. And I would love to show you it. But you're 100% you're on the right track. Now, this position we are so the pawn is coming down this way and we are trying to stop it we want to take opposition now this is still opposition because the king can't come down even though there's a pawn in the way we're still we're still opposition because he mm -hmm. can't come down this way which means he's gonna have to go sideways and if he goes sideways then we want to basically i think there are there are two drawing moves here but we're always going to be going in front of the pawn we're never going to be running like when we're, we're never going up first of all we're never going further away so if you want to lose we're going to go this way this is how we lose um because then he gets this position where he escorts the pawn because these squares are he gets the runway he gets the runway he gets the runway. actually he gets the runway so we're always coming down and we're always staying in front because we are like Cerberus guarding the gates of hell. There is no way he's getting in. <laughs> like he's, we are not moving, okay? Um, so we can stay in front of the pawn. We just move down one. He can't push it because we take and it's a draw. And so he either comes back and we repeat the position. And if the position repeats three times, it's a draw. So that's one way to draw. Mm -hmm. But if he decides to come down and say, I'm going to try to win this, then we are going to take opposition again. And this is why opposition is so key, because he is either going to have to check you with the pawn or move to the side. If he moves to the side, then we are getting repeat. the exact same position we had before. And we're going to repeat. And his other option is to check you with the pawn, at which point we move in front of the pawn. And what does he do? He has to go behind the pawn. And now we have the mirror position of here, just one square in advance. Mm -hmm. And so we can see that this dance that we're doing, he is never getting in front. He's always staying behind the pawn. And now it's very important that you always stay in front of the pawn. So we don't want to move this way because this is another way to lose. Because then we give him opposition. Exactly. And then he if can move he, the pawn if forward. If he gets to take opposition, we're very unhappy. Um, and if we get to a position like this, 
the easiest way to remember it is that if the pawn is reaching the second rank or the seventh rank, if you're white, if it's reaching with check, sorry, if it's reaching with check, it's a draw. If it's reaching without check, it's a, it's a win for them. Um, and that's because, that is because if it reaches with check, we hide underneath it. And then uh, there's nothing they can do. This is going to be stalemate. Like, this is a draw. Exactly. So you can't go anywhere. You can't nope. move. Draw, stalemate. And if he runs away, um, then we take the pawn and we draw by we insufficient draw. material. So if with check, we hide under the pawn and it's a draw. And if without check, then unfortunately the pawn is going to be promoted because we're not hiding underneath it or we're already hiding underneath it. So this is all about um, one move difference. That's the really annoying thing about king and pawn endings is there's never the opportunity to waste time um, here. Like we can't waste time by coming upwards. We are always you know, very, very aware of what's going on, very aware of who's taking opposition and what we need to do, which is to stay in front of the pawn. So would you that think, is so cool. <laughs> do you think that um, from here you would remember? Can you play this out with me? Yes. You, if, if you play as white, can you play this out with me? Uh. Oh, I can't, I can't move oh, it can't? on the okay, board. Well, let me yeah. give you players white. There you go. Can okay. you go now? Uh, nope. Okay. What about now? Yes. Okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go this way this time. Okay, I'm just going to try. This is stressful. I want to make sure that I that I understand <laughs> everything. Um, so we don't want to give the runway, uh, but we got to move. Uh, we obviously can't go here, and we don't want to go here. So use like, we're just going to try to like um, backwards, not forward, and stay in front of the pawn. This is perfect. Exactly. And so if I go here, what do you do? I repeat. Perfect. And so if I come here... Stay in front of the pawn. And I'm going to come down. We want to give up position. So perfect. So good. Exactly. You explained very well. Uh, so now we have check. So we're just going to hold on it. Hide underneath. Mm -hmm. And now we have the same position as before. Exactly. So we're going to do the same thing. Um, but we don't want to go here because this is where if you if it reaches we're going to be forced to move it's going to promote so we want to keep here so if he goes forward and he checks us we hide underneath and what if i come this way oh no <laughs> unfortunately this didn't work out and i think i'm winning this end game yeah you are oh no <laughs> <laughs> okay so let's go back don't worry don't worry Okay, so it was right here. So instead of moving here. So the the thing is, where did we go wrong? So we went wrong here. So we always want to stay in front of the pawn. Ah, oh, it's it is yeah. in front of the pawn. Ah, there mm -hmm. you go. So now here. Exactly. Exactly. And so that means that you're you're always the one getting this opposition. Perfect. And then if he checks, then and we then go I hide on the check you and you hide. Perfect. And that's a draw. Yeah, because it can go here, can go here, can take, can go on the sides because the pawn protects the squares. Exactly. Uh -huh. So when in doubt, stay in front of the pawn. Okay, and that works. Yeah, we got to block, like you said, the gate yeah. of hell. We got to block this runway. <laughs> and it's yeah, so, and so tricky. I love it. <laughs> if Yeah, and so if they're coming down, also, you know, we know opposition. These, these are the two key points is opposition, which I know is probably new. Have you heard about it before? or, or no, no, it was the first time yeah. ever I'm seeing this, the two yeah. kings, one row. Yeah, it's the first time yeah. I hear the term. This this is like the cornerstone of like king and pawn endgames is opposition and 
how the kings are interacting. It's weird because in the rest of chess, the kings are really kind of weak and lame and you just hide them in the corner. But all of a sudden in the end game, they become the most important piece uh, because that's how you're going to get your queen, your extra queen. I love this. Yeah, I have learned so much. This is great. Like now that I know this, the king can never go forward when it's in opposition. He's going to be, always be forced to move um, sideways. So you could always, you, you just can't tell which way the opponent will go. Um, but you, it gives you so much like of an advantage when you're, when you're aware of that, because you're protecting the three squares in front of the king. This is just realizing that is, is going to be very, very helpful already. <laughs> exactly. And this is how you're going to win a lot of end games where you get just when you're just down to pawns because it can be very tricky if you don't know these like key end game techniques to mm -hmm. to win when it's no longer the middle game you no longer have lots of pieces um we're not checkmating a castled king and this is really important to know i think i wasn't taught about this until i was maybe like 1000 and so I was like, I missed so many opportunities to win king and pawn endings, you know? Um, oh, it makes it's such that. a big difference. I also think that it, it's very key for when you're learning these endgames, it teaches you a lot about kind of just how the pieces interact and move anyway, because this will help you as well with your queen and king checkmate or your rook and king checkmate, because especially with the rook and king checkmate, um, the, key, the king is really key in creating this invisible wall. I don't know if so you had a rook and, yeah. king, rook and king checkmate since we looked at them. But, I didn't um, have any, but I remember seeing it because this is how the yeah. king will not be able to go forward. If you keep your king in front, then you move exactly. the rook. The king has no choice to go back up a row. Mm -hmm. And then you, you end up that you're in this situation where there's an invisible wall and then you put your, your rook in the back row and the, it's mm -hmm. finished. The king can't move. Exactly. You know? so so, it's a bit like the, mm -hmm. the same concept. Exactly. They are the same concept. And that's why I wanted to show you this today, because I wanted to build on what we looked at last time. Um, <laughs> my chat is asking me how when I'm going to teach you my the opening that I play, but I'm... Oh, uh, the Rue Lopez? <laughs> yeah. But I think, honestly, I, th I think if you can keep trying with the scotch, I think that it's going to be really good. Mm -hmm. um, you're destroying everyone the rule lopez it's like oh my god if i would play like w if ever one day i reach a decent rating and i would play with you i would just be so petrified because <laughs> <laughs> you are so so strong uh and i don't think to be honest to answer your chat that i'm ready to learn any other um openings uh i just you know i sicilian is in black is okay but i have a hard time with a close sicilian um i also think that the four nights and the scotch is just my thing obviously mm -hmm. the more i go higher up and the more i learn maybe eventually i'll learn a few more openings mm -hmm. um but for me it's not just memorizing the moves of an opening it's understanding the tactical reason as to why we move this piece here mm -hmm. um and until i could figure out the reason behind every single move just memorizing the moves won't help me because when the opening's finished i'm going to be well what do i do now mm -hmm. so I, I prefer I understanding every move that leads to oh this is why we move this and this opening mm -hmm. but i prefer to understand very meticulously moving this creates an opening on this file but also we can this piece but is attacking like i rather understand the technical and the analysis reason behind the moves that i do before i memorize more openings that's how i that, feel yeah that is the best way to learn openings in my opinion and now that i've seen also how much you you love to attack i think the scotch is very complementary to you because it, it will lead to tactical positions and open positions which mm -hmm. will help you get the kind of setups you need to play attacking chess whereas for example the Rui Lopez it's more of a close position and oh. it's yeah exactly and I quite I, like this yeah you like it yeah you, I like, you like close but i hate close position we we have a thing here it's not really mm -hmm. polite so you could beep it on youtube if you want we call it the declusterfuck fuck <laughs> command i feel like it's a cluster when i'm in a close position mm -hmm. and my tension literally goes up and i'm like there's too many possibilities the pieces are too close to each other there's too many capture possibilities i don't like close position mm -hmm. i rather clean up the board and do some exchange i'm like okay whew, the bishops are off the board the knights are off the board there's less possibilities so then I compute mm. better because there's less possibilities because there's less 
pieces. So closed position, you're putting a lot of pressure on me and all my pieces. And I, I don't like it. <laughs> closed like positions it. are really hard. I mean, even I, there are some positions which are definitely too closed. Um, but, but yeah, I like the kind of semi-closed positions. You know, we've still got pawns in the center, but I think that you will really get a lot of great opportunities when you have a more open, more open positions. I think, um, I was just going to ask if there is anything that you, do you see the London system a lot? Uh, yes, I get it. I get yeah. it handed over to me a lot. And, yeah. um, and I was, I was wondering if you would like me to show you what I play against the London system because I yeah because I, I, <laughs> I like to play I like to get um a lot of space and I think that the London system enables that and I think that because you see the London system a lot oh yeah people do just pull out their bishops and I'm like oh yeah. god I hate the London because so, it gives them such a long range with the bishops mm -hmm. I'm like what am I gonna do <laughs> What are you playing right now here? Are you going to play d5 with the, the pawn in the center or are you playing something else? Uh, I tend to go for the pawn because I want yeah. to take equal control of the center, especially when it's queen pawn opening. That's not my opening. But yeah. I favor this because it also gives access right away to the bishop as well. Great. So I just, I go for I the middle. I play this as well. I think this is great. This is very principled. And then they're playing the bishop out right away or they're playing the knight and then the bishop. One, whichever. They're both going to be the same thing exactly um, and so what what do you usually do here my always instinct is to protect this pawn so i either go for like um a knight out which is kind of a variation of the four knights to put protection here mm -hmm. and develop a piece from the back row perfect this is also what i play here i think this is a great move great developing move and um i love it it's also helping to control e4 which is mm -hmm. really nice. And um, I have literally no criticisms because I play this move. I think it's great. Okay. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then they're going to play some variation of moves where they either play like E3 or Knight, Knight. F3 or, you know, something like this. Probably this or, or this. Probably an equal volume. It doesn't really matter. And now what do you play? Like what kind of thing do you go for? Uh, I'm a four knight type of gal, so generally I just go ahead and, you know, take out the knight. I, I know there's like also this possibility because it creates a very strong pawn mm -hmm. structure to move um, uh, e6 and then you get this access with the bishop, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm always hesitant when it comes down to there because... Mm -hmm. You know, going this also covers this, covers this. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, yeah obviously okay. not 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 this but i would be very hesitant in between this or this these would be my two um my two okay. moves so both of these are well e6 i think is gonna be one of the moves we play i just think we'd, we we want to wait and see if we're playing it right now because like you said the bishop um, and knight c6 is definitely also going to be a move we play, but I'm going to tell you something about these d pawn openings. Now, I know you don't play these yourself. I don't play them either, but they're, they're kind of different in nature to the king's pawn openings that we play because the companion pawn to the d pawn is the c pawn. They're best friends. They are lovers. And so... We usually in C in in D pawn openings don't want to block in our C pawn, and it's the same for White. They usually don't want to block this pawn in by putting the knight out in front of it, and so uh, because look, why, it creates a really yeah. strong pawn structure. After I get it, I'm gonna suggest that we play a pretty active move here that I play. Uh, it's C five which is a really nice move because it fights for space in the center. And I would have I never seen that coming because they can yeah. take it, right? Uh -huh. But if they take it, which they they never take it, but maybe they'll take it. We're we're fine. It's not even a gambit because we will 100% get the pawn back every time. Every time we we're, we're getting this pawn back. So the way that we're getting this pawn back 
Because we're going to play knight c6 just like you wanted. Knight c6 stops a couple of things. It stops them from playing b4 and defending this pawn because we would take mm -hmm. it. Whereas if you played this move, then maybe they're going to play b4 and defend it. And now if we play this, they're going to defend. And now we're not getting our pawn back, which is annoying. True. So knight c6, we're always getting this pawn back every time. Let's say um, they play, I think the best move is probably knight f3 because it stops a move like e5. We play e6 mm -hmm. and we get our pawn back. And oh, now I think and we're we ready to castle pretty, and we're we, ready to exactly. castle. And I think we have a really nice position here um, because they don't have this big blockage in the center that they usually do with this pawn triangle. And instead, we have really nice pawns and we're ready to castle. So if you're worried about them taking that C pawn, absolutely don't be because look how great our center is. And I think these pieces coordinate really nicely together. Maybe our only problem piece is this bishop, but he can always come out maybe here or here. And so we're not so worried about, about this. If they play a different move, let's say a move which I don't think is as good. Um, some bishop move or something, then we get this really nice two pawns in the center, which is always the best thing we can have is two pawns in the center. And that's the problem with taking this pawn is if they're, if knight here, okay, he's got two attackers, we can't push, but if he's going to be slow and play like a bishop move, then we get the time to put two pawns in the center and have this open for the bishop, right? Oh my god, so yes. You see how the temporary sacrifice of this pawn has like given us a lot of space and also it's gained some some tempo. And then we just take it back and we have literally the dream. Control position. of the center. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. So <laughs> I would say that the most likely move is that your opponent continues with that development in the London and it also happens to stop this push. But if they do stop e5, then we're very, very happy to play e6 because like you said, we have this very, very strong pawn chain. It's very nice. And we get our piece back anyway. We get our, sorry, get our pawn back anyway. With the bishop. And yeah, honestly, I, th I think you're, you're very happy to play this game of chess with a great development, kings going here, and we have no problems. I think that um, the only thing about playing knight c6 in a position like this is that we're kind of a little bit more like trapped in it feels like we don't have as much uh space because of we're not really fighting back this this deep one and if we have our c pawn here then i really like the way that it kind of puts tension on the center um now let's say they are not going to capture it which i don't think they will because of the reasons we saw it's just really nice for black then we're also just very happy to develop as normal. Play knight c6 just like you were before. And getting our knights out like this is very familiar to you. It's what you do in your other openings. And we're still going to play very principal chess and, and castle and so on and so forth. So they usually play, what do they usually play? Something like c3 or knight here, right? It's one of these moves. Or even bishop, bishop here or here. Any, any combination of these moves is going to be fine. We have to, at some point, figure out, you know, what's going on here. Yeah, and break know, the pawn chain. Right. And I know you're probably going to be thinking, when do we trade? When, like, when do we trade here? Um, mm -hmm. I think that we're pretty happy to wait to trade until after they develop this night. Okay. Someone in my chat says, why do they always count on that they won't attack or force pins on pieces? I think this pin, we're, we're absolutely fine with it. Like here we can even we can just break the pin. Like then they're not really doing anything. Um, or we can trade and break the pin. And then he's kind of forced to trade everything off. And I don't think that this is what white wants is to trade everything off because then we have nice pawns still. Like, I, I don't think any of these pins are very scary, which is why I'm not showing you them because I don't think there's anything very critical here. Um, they could easily be blocked 
you know yeah. by, by a lot of pieces exactly. you can move the queen you can move the bishop you can move the knight in front there's so many ways to to block that pin mm -hmm. um yeah um and so let's let's see what are they gonna play if they play b bishop b2 is a very normal move because it gets ready for castling but mm -hmm. i think it's also gonna make sense if they play like this move as well or whatever um the idea in this line is um at that soon we're gonna go for this early queen b6 move and it's probably gonna be quite foreign to you if you haven't seen it before no why why b6 right so the reason we go for these queen b6 moves is because his bishop has left its post defending the b2 pawn. And so because this bishop is out um, and it can't come back, white has to make a decision because oh. if white allows us to capture this pawn, oh. then first of all, it's a free pawn. If he doesn't get his knight out, then it's going to be a free rook, but it, he's going to get his knight out. And... We're very, very happy here. We have one material, and this is not a poisoned pawn. Poisoned pawn is where your queen is going to get trapped or something like this. It's not a poisoned pawn. We have time. We can even take another pawn here, but, you know, you can always retreat if you're worried. Um, but the, the real reason is there are definitely some lines where they hang this and they hang the rook. But the main line is if your opponent... If your opponent knows the main line, then they're going to play queen b3. Um, and this is going to get you like a very specific type of game, but you're always going to know what to do, which I think is really important because I think it's very difficult sometimes to, to come up with a plan. And if you know what kind of game you're going to get, then you're going to remember, oh, queen b6, queen b3, and we don't trade. Okay. I was going to say, not really like this. We don't trade, right? We don't trade, but we do play C4. And I was going to say that. <laughs> and so the opponent can either come back or they can trade. And if they trade, I promise we're happy. Even though we have doubled pawns. Okay. And we're happy because we have a very clear goal. And our clear goal is that we're going to push these pawns. And so white is getting ready to castle and we're going to push and we're going to push and we're going to undouble our pawns. They're going to be undoubled. And white can't really stop that from happening because if they play a defensive move like a three, it looks like we can't push here, right? Because if we push, they take and oh, it's defended. It's actually not defended because we can take. They take, we and, get the rook. And if they take, we get the rook. Exactly. So we get a lot of um, clear activity on the queen side. Whereas what white wants is they want to attack you on the king side. But we're just going to come with this first. We're going to get our stuff on the queen side. And at some point, we get to put our bishop out here probably a bit later on and we get a lot of control over the queen side and we will usually open up one of these files sometimes we even end up winning pawns because the pressure is quite a lot mm -hmm. and we have a very um very nice position on the queen side even though we have the doubled pawns because we are going to undouble them this is they're not going to be doubled forever so that's okay um how do you feel about that you can <laughs> wow it, it just opened up a whole new world of uh, of possibilities like who knew mm -hmm. that queen to d3 would actually target that that pawn because now if the bishop um left the pawn is unprotected now you know what i'm saying right so, yeah so wow this this is nice because it takes the london system player out of their game and throws them into your game because you know this you you know kind of what your goals are going to be and even if they are playing um queen back we actually have a very nice trick here i would like to show you very oh yeah nice what happens if they if, if they back up if they back up we can play a really crazy move 
and I think you're gonna like it because you like aggressive tactical chess. I'm mm-hmm. gonna play bishop f5, which looks like a free bishop because it's not defended. But we're gonna take this pawn and we're gonna win the rook. And it's very cool because there's nothing they can do about can it. Do. There's nothing they can do. The only thing you need to remember here um, is I don't think you can take this right away because of queen c2 and your queen is a little stuck. So before this, we just need to hit the queen with a tempo, which is already great because we wanted to play that move anyway. Look at how good these pawns are. Look at how good that is. Um, that is crazy. Exactly. Oh my God. And do you see how, how good these pawns are that this queen cannot come back onto this diagonal anywhere? Mm-hmm. The, the queen has got to go somewhere else, um, like here or here. And they actually have no threats. We haven't castled. We're not worried. Our king is fine. And then we just take the rook. And there's nothing they can do about it. And if nothing changes, we we'll actually take the knight too and check yeah, the king. Yeah, so they have to. They have to. So to that's what I was gonna say. Yeah. If if not, if not, uh, you know, we take mm-hmm. again and ends up in the check. Wow, exactly. that's crazy. <laughs> and now you can either just like take here, take the pawn. or you can uh, just develop and get ready to to castle a bit later or whatever. You're you're up an exchange. But not only are you up in exchange, you have like the world's best pawns, which are so nice and solid. And his queen is so rubbish over here. Like it's never getting into the queen side. You have complete control over the queen side. Um, and so this is this very fun trick with bishop f5 that in fact the bishop, although it is not defended and looks free, cannot be taken by the queen. And then it is forced for the queen to go back somewhere, either here or here. Probably, probably here, because otherwise we take here anyway. But do you see how we got really, really nice development? And white, wow. white has moved their queen many times. Um, and I know we haven't castled yet, but we, we are going to get castled. We're going to get this e6 and, and castles. Um, and I just think it is a nice way to play against the London because it almost feels like you're playing with the white pieces a lot of the time because you are setting setting the tone of the game by going oh for God. this. Oh, and yeah. if you go for this and they play something else like B3, then they just kind of have like a worse pawn structure. And you can always either take... And you can have this bishop out here and we're going to get nice uh, control anyway. Or just, you know, play... I mean, I think it would be nice to get the bishop out before we play e6. Or you can play... Um, instead of takes, you can play... I mean, bishop here or bishop here, I think. But the best move... The best option for them is to try to defend this this way because otherwise their pawn chain is is not going to be so nice and the reason that white goes for this pawn wow. chain is yeah. because they lock their bishop out and a lot of the time um a lot of the time we're going to end up trading this bishop for our bishop anyway like even if we didn't play like our normal line there are a lot of the time this trade ends up happening oh yeah um, that happens that happens yeah. a lot and i prefer get right? the bishop out of the way anyways i'm like okay mm-hmm. at least you know we're even uh mm-hmm. yeah 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 this happens a lot and that's the whole reason why they put all of these pawns on dark squares because when the pawns are on dark squares they control the dark squares and they no longer have the dark squared bishop to control those squares so their pawns are now taking that role um, and so that's why they don't mind it being traded off now because they have this nice blockade on the dark squares. But mm-hmm. I think that this line with c5 is a very active way for black to play against the London system. And I think um, I still play it now at my level and I, I specifically play it against people who are a bit lower rated than me because I think it gives black really good winning chances. 
and you it's not a move yeah. that you would expect you're like oh they're gonna mm -hmm. just take the pawn but then you could just get it straight back after with the bishop or with the knight mm -hmm. uh it's just a move that would like you would do that i would be completely thrown off i, I would <laughs> you know i would not know what to do but mm -hmm. now i will i will now be like okay hey c5 I can wow. send you. I can send you um, some ex maybe some example games in this line. So, or I'll send you some resources so that you remember this line, like something to show it. Um, yeah. Because I think it is. I think it's really going to be useful, especially because I expect that you see the London system a lot. I do, and, um, and it just throws me off so much because I there's a piece i really despise and i really mm -hmm. despise bishops because they're they're snipers and you know they, they especially the backwards sniper moves from the bishop where like they get the rook because they're all the way across the board i'm like you know <laughs> it just uh, i prefer when i have a chance to trade a bishop for a bishop to just get the mm -hmm. bishops off the board <laughs> yeah yeah the bishops the bishops can be very very strong um Especially when they are in a, in a fianchetto, you know, when they're playing like this. Um, but but yeah, this bishop, the London bishop, can be very frustrating. And and I mean, later on down the line, when we trade all of this stuff off, we are probably at some point gonna trade this, or either that, or our bishop will become a, a nice strong piece over on the queen side. So we yeah. we are never that concerned by this piece in this in this line with c five. This piece is never becoming so much of an issue. Um, wow. And and yeah, I think it's very nice. And I think the main thing you need to remember here is that if they are capturing this pawn, which they probably shouldn't, but if they are, then you are having to always put the knight out because we are preventing them from defending it. Um, so that's just, just one thing to remember that you want to get your pawn back. Because if you don't get your pawn back, then they kind of get this queen side control that you were looking for. Yeah, exactly. We don't want to give them that. So if they take the pawn, we put the knight. If they don't take, uh, mm. we go queen d3. Uh, Not right away, queen, queen but b6. right after. Queen b6. Uh, b6. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. No, no, no. Don't, don't, don't apologize. So yes, yeah. we cannot defend this anymore. And we exactly. are getting this back. Yeah. Wow, that um, is crazy. So yeah, I th I think if you see this, you'll be very happy. I think black is very comfortable here. But even if they're not taking it, um, and also this this C file, we haven't really talked about it, but in this line where they do take, you have the semi open C file. So we're gonna put a rook on it at some point, and we're gonna get a really nice control. Our rooks always want to be on open and semi open files. So I think that the plans are really clear for black. I think that's why it's nice because uh, in, I know you love the four knights, but I find that in these kinds of four knights positions where um, things can be a bit closed, it can be hard to, to figure out plans sometimes. Uh, it also gets very symmetrical. Like the moves are mm -hmm. often very mirrored. And then I don't, yeah. I, I play well the beginning and then maybe 10 moves in. I'm like, what do I do? I don't have any like perfect attack scenarios or um, so I feel confident with it because I know where the piece are going and I understand what yeah. the role is. But after, let's say, 10 moves like mid game, I f mm -hmm. I, I'm starting not to feel as confident anymore because I don't know what to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. OK, if you if you have some games like like that, um, you can send them to me and we can we can maybe next lesson we can look at them and we can talk about like middle game plans or ideas and things like that to how we make oh, that transition from the opening to the middle game. Does that sound good? That would be, yeah, that sounds really good because yeah. that's something that after, let's say, uh, knights are out, bishops are out, pawn structure is good, I've castled, moved the queen out of the way and then the rooks are connected. This is really my first 10 moves. Then I'm mm -hmm. like, what now? Mm -hmm. And then it's hard for me to say, okay, I'm going to do this attack or this or target. Like for now, I didn't know. I had no idea the, you know, how, how B2 pawn, um, if the rook yeah. is still there. Wow. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think my first 10 moves are generally very solid. And then it's yeah. always between like move 11 and 20, like mid game that I, I tend to sack things. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for initiative. Yes, and then yeah. I, I screw myself up because I, I went for counterattack and then it resulted in a worse counterattack. And then I get, I get you know, it's, 
yeah <laughs> i know what you mean i think um i think it can be very hard especially when you're playing a new opening to know the the plans in the middle game and um i very often like for example last week in my tournament i decided to play an opening i don't usually play because when you play over the board tournaments your opponents usually google you to see what you play and so oh, i Jesus. played something different to throw off future opponents but because it was something I don't usually play, I had to ask my coach. I had to say, well, what are the middle game plans here? What are we usually doing? Like, what is going to be the plan later on? Because, you know, I never play this. And when you have enough time, like an hour and a half in a long game, you have enough time to figure stuff out. But it's always very helpful to know what the general ideas are in an opening that you've just learned or, or um, in a line, something like this, like, like I, it would be no good for me to show you this c5 stuff without showing you that we're going to play queen b6 and that that we're going to push our b pawn because you have to know that you're going to push the pawn you have to know that they can't take with the a pawn and um so all of these ideas that work together that are kind of longer term ideas doesn't mean it's all going to happen every game doesn't mean that they're always going to play the exact same stuff but i want to give you at least a few tools for um for the sake of pattern recognition but also for the sake of feeling comfortable because I, I don't want you to to feel uncomfortable because then i think that's when things start to go wrong what i like to do what i like to do after your lessons is just go watch and go back and watch the vod <laughs> and uh memorize yeah. the pattern like the, the landing with the airstrip and the king being the mm -hmm. crap like the tower control really 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 opened my eyes on how much we're controlling the three squares to, to mm -hmm. push for promotion and end game and now this i'm like oh my god now nah, i just look at b2 i'm like we we could just take that pawn and the <laughs> rock and voila you know this just looks like so easy now mm -hmm. uh but i know it's not but it just it, it opens so my much mind easier when when you've been shown them and when you're not like doing it on your own it, it's chess is chess becomes so much more accessible as soon as you have even just like a little bit of of help like, exactly when it when yeah. it gets breaking down you're like oh hey this works mm -hmm. this works mm -hmm. this is wonderful mm -hmm. <laughs> okay good i'm so glad um did you have any questions because i've that's that's all I had for you today. Um, oh, it's amazing. <laughs> I I um, didn't want to. I never want to go over more than like two. Like you've been very patient. We've been here for two hours, um, and I feel like you've had to deal with a lot of different new concepts. So, if, was there anything that was unclear that you'd like to to look at again, or? Do you think no, that if you, you explained okay. amazingly well, I'm just going to have to practice it. Maybe have, mm -hmm. like you said, someone play the scotch. I could play with people and say, you are forced to play the scotch. I will master these moves and you need mm -hmm. to play these first five moves and right. get that to practice just so I understand visually mm -hmm. why. Um, and then practice maybe this. So you need to move mm -hmm. the pawn and you do not take like you need to let me figure this out because mm -hmm. that way I get to play with other people and I also get to in store these mechanisms that you just you just taught me um it's just going to be to understand not just memorize but why was this piece there and think of a bit like what people were saying the the next five or six steps okay we're moving there to target the spawn to then take the rook to then move this and then move that there okay that's the that's the plan because it's not just oh move your queen to d3 then i'm going to probably end up sacking it like you know what i'm saying i'm going to probably take the b2 pawn while the bishop is still on the back row <laughs> so you don't want to just move your queen for moving your queen you want to mm -hmm. you want to understand when to do these things for sure i i think that this is um a really good key understanding that you have whereas i see a lot of people who do just try to memorize move by move um and that will only take you so far because you need the deeper understanding of why the moves are made and yeah so i think that practicing you playing the Scotch Gambit as white and playing against the London with this system with C5. I think these could be really helpful for you to get more of a familiar feeling with the, the positions. And I think that if you're not having such a great time with chess streams, then maybe this could be a different way to play your viewers in these specific openings. Instead of, you know, playing ranked chess and, and feeling stressed with like rating and stuff like this, because you can play unranked against your viewers. That's Mm -hmm. I never play rated games against my viewers. Um, 
So, <laughs> so yeah, I think that would be a great way to practice. I still don't want to discourage you from doing puzzles, but I do want to remind you that most positions are not puzzles and the but yeah, exactly. Perfect. I think I it's think to the... apply the idea behind <laughs> uh -huh. a puzzle because they're, they're showing you you could do a back row checkmate. So uh -huh. the puzzles are more there to like give you the ideas of what you could do. But no game ever was like, oh, this was a puzzle number, whatever it was. And you just yeah. move the piece perfectly. It never works that way. And the puzzles mm -hmm. are made that the piece are going to retaliate like they want for you to solve the puzzle, which is when as a human, they could decide to sacrifice a pawn. They could decide to gobble something. They could go for an attack. So when you're playing against a human, it's really not like a puzzle. So you have to keep the idea of what the puzzle taught you. But it's, you know, games are not puzzles. And I really am going to have to... to like not undo that, but keep that more present when I play. <laughs> I know what you mean, especially playing faster games. I always feel like there should be tactics everywhere and it's not always the case. So, so don't worry. It's definitely not just you. I think a lot of us are looking for tactics all the time. It's because, you know, we're, we're always taught like checks, captures, attacks, always checks, captures, attacks. And so we're always looking for that tactic. And it's actually more rare than we think it is that it shows up. You're right. But, but yeah, so I, I hope you enjoyed the lesson. Thank you so I much really for, for joining me again on, on my stream for, for another lesson. I really enjoy doing these because I feel very um, strongly and passionately about seeing women, especially as adults, getting into chess as adults, because that's exactly what I did. So I hope that maybe this has like given you a little bit more like excitement to try chess again yeah yeah I you know i really did that, that helps me yeah <laughs> yes good well, when you have someone explaining to you you feel more attracted to us like okay i'm gonna put my <laughs> hatred away from losing like 30 40 <laughs> ranking and sacking my past 10 games and we're gonna do it maybe just unrated get the fun back chess exactly. unless you're a professional um, um chess is a hobby it's something that you decide mm -hmm. to learn um and you could get really good at it but i don't think there's any anything wrong with taking a break or feeling angry it's just an anything Thing you sure. do you could just feel saturated um you just like desaturated that for me today because now there's new possibilities new moves more understanding behind moves i've seen that i didn't know why was that done mm -hmm. um so I feel like this has been not only very helpful, um, but it gave me like the passion a little bit again of like, okay, hey, I could try this. I could try something new. I could do it. I could do it. And your explanation are always so uh, clear and precise. And you have a way of transmitting the knowledge, not just by like slamming down theory, but, but by also showing it in progress with other combinations. So I believe you're also an amazing teacher. Thank you for taking the time to teach me of all people. Of Thank you. <laughs> I i'm very yeah i'm very excited that you're feeling better about chess after this and i would love to do another lesson with you in a month or yay, I, yeah yay. To see that go go subscribe to lula's socials she's on instagram she has a beautiful cat she also thank has you. a lot of cool content on youtube so make sure to go hit up her socials everywhere thank you so much you're you're too kind to me i'm gonna no, i'm gonna rate everybody over on to oh, you now thank and you. All right. this video will go up on youtube so anyone who would like to rewatch, or anyone who missed it will be able to see it so oh thank have you a great so rest end of your day. thank you take care lula thank you again so much for your time i fully appreciate it thank you so much